Or audioing. Rolling. Rolling. Camera. Rolling. Audio on. Who's watching you? We have audio. Camera two. Pretending it's a. everybody and welcome to episode 30 of Nights at the Round Table. Today we are discussing the book Valor's Choice by Tanya Huff. I don't have a physical copy of the book because I left it at home with my notes because I am clever that way. Um, I'm sitting here with Garth and Rob and I'm going to start with general impressions of the book. Garth, you're first. Uh, general impressions of the book was that it was very standard Tanya Huff. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it was okay. It was decent. Uh, as far as military fiction goes, it is almost completely everything I expected it to be. Uh, for the most part, I was bored with it. Okay. Yeah, throughout. Uh, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't engaging, I should say. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Rob? Um, well, there was a lot of things that struck me about it. It was like the, only the second Tanya Huff book that I've ever read. Um, and one of the things I really did like about it was that the military part of it seemed to go over pretty well. The characters behaved sort of like I would expect them to behave. So it feels to me like she really did her research pretty well. Um, you said you were a little bit bored with it. What, the one little criticism I did have with the book was even though it flowed pretty well, I was expecting more action to happen out of it when it just ended up being a lot of character interplay. Mm -hmm. Alright, so I'm, yeah, I'm sort of the same. I'm not familiar with Tanya Huff's work, actually. This is the first Tanya Huff I ever read, and as far as books go, it was alright. It was a decent read. I mean... It wasn't one of the books that I hated so much that I shut it and threw it across the room. Um, but <laughs> it wasn't, yeah, it, it wasn't spectacular. It was a good read, it was decent. I would recommend anybody read it, but it wasn't spectacular. And yes, the, the military people behaved as I would expect bored military people to behave, right up until the end when there was that big battle. Um, but that big battle, it, it's like she saved up all of the action for that one scene which lasted about a third of the book. Um, but it would have been nice to have a bit more action sprinkled throughout. I think part of the problem was also in the nature of the action. I mean, this is like a spacefaring, you know, tech level military book. So when you're pitting, you know, space age sort of soldiers against basically spear-wielding savages spear-wielding savages with bows and arrows um, hey it worked on Pandora <laughs> it's true but there was there was a serious tech problem in this battle um, now the way it was solved in the book was that in typical fashion the spear-wielding lizards had massive numbers um, but then again the good guys who were higher tech, were bunkered. So it didn't make for the world's most interesting and engaging battle. It was a lot of, you know, guys sitting behind, sniping at people, occasionally machine gunning, chatting with their people, chatting with their people, toss a grenade. And so you never really felt that the characters were going to get seriously screwed up. Every once in a while, Something would happen, somebody would die. But I personally didn't feel any fear for the main characters. Oh, goodness, no. no. There was no fear at all for the main this characters. Is, it was a fairly standard siege narrative, is uh -huh. what it is. Did like, you read the, uh, the fi uh, final word where she said it was based on the It was battle? based on an actual siege. Uh, uh, the Zulus? 4,000 Zulus yeah. against 150 Brits. You know. uh, but you know, as far as it goes, it is... It, the battle scene was very standard issue. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a standard issue siege. You've got a low number of people in an entrenched position with a huge number of uh, lower tech other people coming in. Now, the lizards did, the, the Silsvis uh, is their name, the, the lizards did have a couple high-tech weapons that they yeah. looted. Yeah. 
Um, and all of it was a setup from start to finish. Spoiler alert! Really. Spoiler <laughs> for the end of the book. <laughs> uh, and but you could tell that from very early on. Yes, you could. Like the moment. Okay, I so in the middle when they get spoiler alert shot down uh, over a swamp. I'm like, okay, there's a couple things that could be going on here. It could be this mysterious others that they're actually fighting. And if that's true, then this is going to get interesting. It could be like a, a one of the local critters doing this. And if that's true, well, I, I don't expect them. I expect them to get out of the swamp before things get interesting. And the third one is it's the setup from start to finish, in which case they're it's just all for show. And a bunch of people are going to die for no reason. And that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so... There, there was no surprises in this story. All the characters were cliché to the extreme. Uh, down to the sexy space elves. Like, they... <laughs> <laughs> Every military character That's was... That's what they're going to be called from now on. Just the sexy space elves. Well, they even mentioned it at some point in the book. That when humans first met these... What? What were they called? Did, did, the uh, Detraken? Did, or something like that? Detraken? Something Detraken. along those lines. Uh, when humans first met these Detraken, they were like, bah, space elves. And it sort of it stuck. stuck. Yeah. Well, yeah, one of the things that made me smile, though, was that she would mentioned that these sexy space elves decided they liked being... Sexy uh, space elves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, a, a, one of them, I think, was given the name um, Caraborn. In honor, <laughs> in honor of... <laughs> From the, Lord of the From the Lord of the Rings, yeah. in honor of the elves that the humans had given the yeah, name to. Let's be honest, though, about this. Let's say the three of us take our ship, we go into space, we meet other We're people, and they're like, you people are hot as shit. We'd be like, yes, we are. Thank you. Yes, yes. You so, Especially uh, since... I don't really... Uh, I no. like the I like the alien cultures a bit. Come on, no. You would you would you would not think that's awesome just no. a little bit. No. No, just based on like the annoyances that you get, even if you're slightly pretty. Okay, okay. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. Okay, you're a nymphomaniac. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. No, if I'm a nymphomaniac, that changes things. Because remember, they're an entire <laughs> race of nymphomaniacs. Mm. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, like they're. they're yeah, okay, if I was a nymphomaniac and somebody said, holy crap, you're sexy as shit, I'm like, you and me. And but that's I'm exactly not. what they do. And, uh, I mean, they've got fair It looks like I just got else wants to do it. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> that, there were interesting bits, and but uh, every character was a an archetype. Mm -hmm. Every character was not a character so much as, you know, their role in the story. Uh, the main character, what's her name? Uh, uh Taren, Torin? Torin Kerr, or whatever. Yeah, Sergeant uh, Kerr. Yeah, she Stop is Sergeant. the archetypal sergeant. Like, there's nothing to her except this role. Lieutenant What's-His-Name, that she sleeps with in the beginning, yeah. is, uh, completely forgettable. And, again, an archetype, the... The lieutenant who is who is a good officer and yeah. who is learning to be yeah, a good the, officer. Yeah, uh, the untested officer. Yeah, who is a decent. All of, like the there's the the enlisted men who are uh, bored on duty and must go out and have a drink with the locals. Like it's all so one hundred percent by the numbers cliche that I can't imagine Tanya have doing more than just knocking this off in a weekend without too much thought. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. And I, I think she, she, she gave it a bit more than that. And <laughs> while, while, they do, out of it, so. while they do agree that the soldiers did follow their roles, that's one of the things I actually like about military books. I really hate it when the soldiers don't know their roles, because then they're shitty soldiers and the premise of the whole thing just sucks. Mm. So maybe they could have had more flair, but well, yeah, I like so, the I'm fact sort of, had more I'm flexibility. I'm sort of in agreement with you too, because once you've been doing something for so long, you a lot of people become that thing, right? There are a lot of people who don't separate themselves from their role in their their thing, right? So you'll meet somebody and they're like, oh, hi, who are you? Um, what do you do? And he goes, I'm a soldier. And then 
that's their entire identity is they're a soldier. And so when you're in a unit, it's your entire you're you're a soldier and then you're a heavy gunner and that's your entire identity. It happens. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the the races because we're chatting oh, a little bit. Oh yeah. In the break. Um, again, it was it felt a lot like well, there's the arachnid slash insectoid race and then there's a reptilian race and then there are the mammals. It felt very much like they were included just to be included. Although the only one that got any real airtime were the detrakin. Detrakin. I can't even remember how to pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> but the sexy space. The elves. sexy space elves are the only ones who got a lot of on-camera time and explanation because, again, the lieutenant is one of them, and the sergeant had slept with them. So hey. They've got to explain a bit more, so they're always talking about those guys and never talking about the other ones. The only other ones we really hear about are the big giant bear well, sloth people. They're sloth people, yeah, actually. Yeah, and the, and the Mintok, the, the spiders. The spiders, yeah. yeah. See, I, I felt that the other races did get a little bit more exposure. Then. Um, and I was, maybe it's because I was interested in that exposure. Like, I like the, what was it, the craw? The one that eats all the time. The cry. Yeah, the cray. cray. Yeah. The cray. Um, the other militant species. Yeah. I liked that. I liked that the giant characters were also the dorm... Dormians? I, I cannot I remember. Cannot the, remember. Giant yeah, the, giant yeah, the giant sloth people? Yeah, the giant sloth people. people yeah. I, I per Sorry, Tanya. I sort of visualized them more like giant cat people. The really? sloth people? They've yeah. got big old claws, they move slowly, they've got a huge amount of bulk, they, they sound like sloths yeah. to me. But what I liked about it is, while they were the most physically imposing and large characters, but they were also the least violent. And they were very thoughtful. And I liked the idea of, like, you know, the big, thoughtful giants. So, it, it, I found that kind of cool. Maybe in the other books they'll explore more about the other races, but as an intro, I found that the information that we were given about them was pretty appropriate. Well, it's what you needed to know about them, right, to make yeah. sense of what happens later in the story. Giant sloth people. And like all the elder races, the original races of this confederation, are all just complete and utter pacifists. They, they can't even bring themselves to hurt somebody. I mean, you say that, but they did arrange with the Silvis, Silvis to, you know, obliterate a <laughs> regiment. Yeah, that, <laughs> so, uh, uh, that does sound. But did they arrange it? I no. I don't think it was, it was them. I think it, it was, was the, the Confederation Parliament. No, I think I it was, think it was, it was the, the Silvis and the humans who set that up. Mm. And the diplomats were just, unfortunately, along for the ride. It's mentioned that something like this would have had to have been decided by Parliament. Well, mm -hmm. I haven't read any of the other Valor's books, but no, I do mind. know that things go a little badly for the uh, uh, for the elder races in that they're not exactly as trustworthy as they seem. Yeah, no. Uh, but as far as it went, the uh, the ones in the book that were introduced to are just utterly incapable of being useful uh, in combat. Uh, oh, the Mictoc did okay with the the, the, the Mictoc did did nice with their with their run around until one of them got and beat, and then they all just web themselves into a corner. Yeah, because they're just terrified. Uh, the bird people, except for the doctor, are completely useless. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, what was it? Uh, the big guys they get one moment of glory when one of them goes snaps and just starts Strength ripping into arm. people. Yeah, and then the, they just huddle in the room and they're like, nope. <laughs> it's like, yeah. guys, you could come out, you could help. It'd be awesome. You're great. And they're like, no, no. no. <laughs> but I mean, from sticking with what she set up for the characters, if you are a super super peaceful race that used to be a little bit more bitey and clawy in the past, but you've gone through centuries of peacefulness and whatever, and suddenly you know, you've never hurt a soul for a long, long time, and then one of you goes batshit crazy and kills a lot of people, I fully expect everybody to be like, oh yeah, god! There'd be, there'd be a fair amount of trauma associated yeah. with it. So, yeah, I agree. It was okay. Yeah, that's that. fine. <laughs> did, didn't have any problem with that. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't really have any problem with any of them. It's just... They lacked a flair, as you said. They lacked character. 
And as far as the elder races go, yes, we do see a bit of them, but not a lot. They're, they're relegated to kind of a side thing because they're not soldiers. They're mm -hmm. civilians, so they get lumped into all one big group. Uh, we see a little pieces of them here and there, but not much more. I'm sure Tanya Huff actually has a very detailed and uh, and much larger idea of these creatures, but we don't see it in this book. Yeah, I was actually that you them. don't. Yeah, you don't need to see it in this, this book. Is, yeah, this is about the soldiers. Yeah. So we see a lot more of the the Detraken, who of whom there are a lot more. And what is it? Cray. 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 Yeah. We see a bit of the Cray because there's one major character. You guys say your A is weird. Crawfish? That's, yeah, that's what, how uh, I was remembering it. There, there's one major character who's a Cray, and there is that's one who, hands. secondary character is a Cray, and that's it. So we know that they've got facial ridges that change color, we know that they eat anything, and we know that they have big feet, and that's it. We get nothing more. Nothing about their personalities. Otherwise, they're perfectly human in mm -hmm. every personality way. Uh, at least the space elves are nymphomaniacs. <laughs> that's that you remember. <laughs> <laughs> like we, we hear a lot more about them, about like the difficulties they get to go through, because they they've got to be wearing this pheromone masker all the time, or everyone around them is just going to be you know all over them. Uh, we hear that every free moment they get, they're having sex with each other or whoever else will uh, get in on it. Uh, we hear about their their issues with their hair. We hear about like issues like all sorts of other things because there are much more major characters who are Detraken than are Cry or are any of the other species, and that's just the fact of the story, I guess. Yeah, it, yeah. They are a much also, more important race. We hear much more about them. Also, yeah, I think it comes down to what the author is most interested in. And it seems to me that sexy space, space elves were the flavor of the book for the, for the author. I'm pretty sure for uh, other books, I, she must go into greater detail about the other races. I don't doubt it, but yeah. I haven't read them. <laughs> yeah, no, ni neither have I. I mean, this is my mm -hmm. first ever Tanya Huff, so. I've read uh, her Wizard in the Grove ser uh, books and her Blood books, so I've read a lot more oh, okay. Tanya Huff. Right. Um, I liked the attitudes of the soldiers. It rang very true for me. Um, I like that they swore a lot, because that also rang very true for me. I don't know why the swearing was misspelled, but, I mean, whatever. It's the future. It's the future. Seas don't exist in the future. I guess not. Yeah. Uh, as far as that goes, I, I do agree with you. It does, I mean, they are walking cliches, but it's cliche for a reason. Yeah. Like, no. That's how soldiers do behave. Uh, it, it means they're kind of boring and they're utterly predictable, but it's what they would do. How like, do you like the lizard culture? The lizard culture was your standard proud warrior race uh, with, you know, the usual little bits. They, she needed some, some culture who was somewhat savage in a certain way. So yeah, all their males go off and kill each other to death in the forests. And when like, when I was so, reading that, hmm. I was sitting there and I was like, okay, so they've invited these people to join the Confederation, right? And a lot, like you said, a lot of the elder members of the Confederation were really, you know, like, non-violent and whatever. And all of a sudden you've invited this other race to join where... You know, they send their young out to fight and die until enough of them have been culled and to come up. Yeah. So I was like, oh man, this is going to get interesting. Well, yeah, They're was, a society that runs yeah. on Klingon promotion, too. Kill the guy above you, you're now in his position. Yeah. Like, I was, the, the reason for the invitation, I imagine, would be the same reason that the Confederation agreed to adopt the humans into the yeah. confederation is they need they're not going to do their dirty work they need somebody else to do the dirty work for them mm -hmm. but at the same time politically that could get interesting in later books yes so. it could and there was a talk of the political ramifications yeah. right at the end of the book where instead of killing the general as she was expected to by the silvers she killed uh, she, or didn't she, kill she didn't kill anyone she attacked the silvers and made them yield so yeah well, there's that that's actually because she understood better the Silvis uh mentality I mean, yeah. than the general did the general's like she uh we need her to kill me because then they'll see oh they're strong they they will do this but she knew that that would just actually send a message of weakness yeah exactly so um how did you guys feel about uh chris uh, I forget his last name. The um, the Sils Silsvis that was as assigned to the diplomatic mission on board the ship. He was kind of a non-factor. 
If they had done more with suspicion about him being in on the plot, it would have been much better. Uh, yeah, I agree. As it was, he was just another dude. Yeah. Or he was there to explain what the, the adolescent males were up to and what they were thinking of. That's all his, his entire role in the plot was to be a sympathetic uh, Silsvis who would explain what's going on. Yeah. Or if he had been more involved in the defense. Yeah, he was just another soldier. Because at one point they were like, you know, you're not, we're going to trust you, but we're not giving you a gun. Stand in the corner, shut up, and if you really need to say something, say it. And then at one point they're just like, we're so down on guys, here's a rifle. But then, aside from one point they mentioned that he was just shooting away, they really didn't talk about what he was doing in the fight. He didn't do if he had anything proposed special. some tactics that were helpful or whatever. I mean, yeah, could... uh, and more beyond that, back to if they had done more to plant suspicion about this character, it would have worked much better, I feel. Because, um, yeah, he did feel like just another dude on the thing. And I'm like, you could have done so much more with that suspicion. You could have played really awesome psychological games with everybody second-guessing him or you each other. Have. or. It, yeah. it really would have made the situation a lot more tense mm -hmm. if maybe this guy really was in on it and was going to stab them in the back at some point. Like, okay. He, also, well, okay, I won't, I won't speculate on how I could have made this story better. Cause... Also, <laughs> the only character who really was suspicious of him was the other lieutenant who nobody really liked or trusted anyway. Yeah. Yeah. If one of the main characters had been really suspicious of him, that would have had a really good interplay between the main character group. Yeah, if it was uh, right. Lieutenant Sexy Times, who... Uh, <laughs> Who was who was suspicious of him? It would have been a lot better because it would have actually given him uh, a reason to come to uh, to loggerheads with the uh, sergeant. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they would have had Lieutenant Jarrett is always going to be Lieutenant Sexy Times now. <laughs> <laughs> Just okay, so Tanya yeah. in future books, Lieutenant Sexy Times. <laughs> Throw it in once. You don't even have to say it all the time. Just slip that in there, and we'll be like. <laughs> fan service. Yeah, while well, he was introduced. <laughs> well, yeah, and also, um, when you find out he's the lieutenant, I got a reel of all the joints in the world. Look, we knew that into. was happening, though. Yeah, I knew it was going we, to happen, it, but there it was been... no, like, okay, the line she says when she leaves his quarters at the beginning is, I'll never see him again. I'm like, you will. Yeah, you he's will. He's going to be in charge of your unit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's sort of plain, but uh, yeah, again, it really had that of all the joints kind of idea, hmm. you know, and that's all I could think of. That's like that whole paragraph I'm reading it and I'm like, eh, Casablanca. <laughs> it's so <laughs> cliche. <laughs> it's so cli That's why I say she banged it out in a weekend because it's just one cliche after another. And but it flows very well. She didn't have to think about much of this book. It does flow very well. She's a good writer. Like, she took it and it flows. The characters are decent. I don't hate any of them. No. Like, they're, they all work, uh, but it, it is just so uncreative <laughs> that, uh, sadly, it, it, it's just so uncreative that I just, I can't find it more than boring. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, any other thoughts before we go to our final, final thoughts and star rating? Is there anything that really, really bugged you about this book, or something that you thought was phenomenal? You know what? The, the worst, the worst part about it is, I, I feel like for the purpose of a panel, like he's like, I, I feel like I need to really, really, you know, su support it in some way. But it's just the nature of the book that there wasn't really anything I hated about it. I thought it was generally done in in a decent fashion. But by the same token, there's nothing that I really, really loved about it either. So. Not really. Not really. Well, it's same for you. I'm going to it's you. No, there's nothing I hated. Nothing I really loved. Uh, it, if it was part of, it is part of a series, but it's the introduction to the series, and I, I find it to be a lackluster introduction to a series uh, that could possibly go much further. There's clearly a, a larger universe behind it, and these characters, if given more than just standard issue uh, archetypes to be then they can really grow into something interesting. They just didn't in this book. In and this it, book, yeah. there, there was no character development because there was no character... They didn't have to be. They're all archetypes. They're all fitting into their roles perfectly well. Uh, 
So why? I mean, the sergeant doesn't grow in character. The lieutenant does, but that's his entire role to be a you know a learning leader. You know? <laughs> so nothing changes. Some people die. So what? <laughs> <laughs> you monster! <laughs> but by that same token, none of the people who died were the top three or four main characters. No, no main no. characters died. <clears throat> so yeah. Okay, so yeah. let's. Um. So, uh, my final thoughts were sort of along the same lines. This book uh, is something you can easily finish in about two or three hours. It feels sort of old school pulp, sci-fi pulp book. Um, which, you know, sometimes you're just in the mood for something like that, something like Fluffy. It was well worth the read. I, I don't regret reading it at all. Um, but yeah, it could have, could have had a bit more to it, I think, a little bit more body. So star rating, Rob? I'd give it a... somewhere between... Around a two, I guess, two and five. I mean, I'd read the next one. I want to see where it's going. Um, but it didn't really grip me, and it wasn't really what I expected either. I mean, this is like an award winning author. And based on the other book of hers that I read, The Silvered, I, I, would, I came into this expecting big things, because that book I loved. But this one, I was like, eh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So, that's where I'm at. Uh, I say it's fairly standard Tanya Huff. I have not read The Silvered. Uh, maybe I should pick that up and take a look if you if you recommend yeah. it so much. Uh, as far as what I've read of hers, because I've read more of her, her pulpy stuff, the, the vampire books and the, the straight-up high fantasy books. And just like them, it's kind of walking cliches everywhere and, and archetypes rather than characters. Actually, uh, I would say that's more a feature of the blood books, the uh, the vampire books, than it is of her her high fantasy wizard of the grove series, because that one actually went right off the rails and did some weird things with it, whereas the the vampire books were absolutely standard issue. The characters were interesting, but other than that, I like how she had a mummy in one of them though. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> she actually used a, uh, an ancient Egyptian mummy. It was fun, uh, but. This is more like that, except duller, I think. <laughs> and uh, so I, I can't hate it. I can't like it. I won't give it... And because there's nothing to hate, I can't go lower than a three. And because there's nothing to love, I can't go higher than a three. So yeah. three it is. Yeah. Um, I'm the same way. Three. It was a good book. It's a fun, light, fluffy read. It is exactly what you expect when you pick up like a sci-fi military book of that size. Um, there was nothing really all that outstanding, and there was nothing really that I despised that I couldn't get over like I have with some books. <clears throat> I won't name names. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it was a good read. Really, I, I don't regret reading it at all. It was a pleasant way to spend two and a half hours of my afternoon yesterday. So yeah, read it. Alright, who wants to pick the next one? I'll pick it. We have... Oh god, why do you have to? <laughs> I'm <Cursive>, sorry. <laughs> Would you like me to read it? Uh, I think I can read it. Ancillary Justice by Anne Lackey. Yes! Oh, this is a, a, another suggestion um, by our, our viewer Tim Selma. Hi Tim! Thank you for suggesting the book. So in a few weeks time we will be discussing Ancillary Justice by Anne Lackey. If you have any thoughts about Tony Huff's uh, Valor's Choice, do leave them in the comments. We also have a Goodreads uh, book club where you can discuss it if you choose. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks very much, guys. Bye. Ciao. And time. Get out.